Our scripture reading today comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 9, verses 1 through 6. Then Jesus called the twelve together and gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. And he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. He said to them, Take nothing for your journey, no staff, nor bag, nor bread, nor money, not even an extra tunic. Whatever house you enter, stay there and leave from there. Wherever they do not welcome you, as you are leaving that town, shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. So they departed and went through the villages, bringing the good news and curing diseases everywhere. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Hi, friends. I hope you're having a good summer. One of the things that happens to me during the summer is at some point I start getting nostalgic about all of the family road trips that I took in my childhood. Summer is a time of travel and adventure for many people. Maybe some of you have already been on a road trip this summer, or maybe you have plans for one in the next few weeks. Well, in today's scripture lesson, the disciples are themselves sent out on a type of road trip. Jesus has called them together and has given them this instruction to hit the road. They also receive the command from Jesus to go forth and spread God's love to all that they meet. Now, I am certain that this adventure is not the type of vacation that the disciples would choose for themselves. Rather, it sounds like a business trip that the boss is telling them that they have to take. Well, I've been thinking about those earliest followers of Jesus and how they were called to go forth and share the good news of God's love. And I've been thinking about how we today are still called to share that same good news of God's love. And I've been thinking about all of this in light of our current context and the ongoing changes in the landscape of religion in our society today. You know, some of us have been following a series of articles in the New York Times by writer Jessica Gross. These um, articles taken together are um, good seeds for conversation about the state of the church in our society. And the very titles of her articles ask honest and personal questions, such as, lots of Americans are losing their religion, have you? Other articles carry very blunt statements. Christianity's got a branding problem. Perhaps like those earliest disciples, you and I today embark on a road trip called the work of the church in the world today. And like those earliest disciples, we look ahead and we might feel confused or disheartened or ill-equipped for the journey ahead. I wonder, friends, if we take our family road trips as a metaphor for being the church today, I think that we can learn some valuable lessons, lessons that assist us in taking our next faithful step. Lesson one, the destination is important, but it's not everything. Sure, we need to know where we're headed, at least to some extent, but the journey of getting there is important in and of itself. Some of us, some of us are old enough to remember the excitement of flipping through the pages of the AAA triptychs, outlining how we get to our destination. Or maybe some of us still have those old paper maps floating around in our glove compartment in the car. You know, those fold up maps that once unfolded are impossible to fold back accurately together. Well, my parents used all of these resources because, of course, when I was a kid, we didn't have things like Google Maps or the Waze driving app. And on my family road trips, I will say that the only thing I knew how to do was to ask that question that every parent dreads, are we there yet? We might ask that similar question when considering other things in our life. Are we there yet? Have I reached my personal goals? As a church, have we fulfilled our mission? Are we there yet? 
Those aren't bad questions necessarily, but perhaps another question could be more helpful. A question like, what are we learning along the way? How has this journey shaped and formed me? Consider our commitment on the work of anti-racism here at University UMC. It was years ago that a racial justice task force was created. Leaders since then have adopted a statement and a commitment to work on dismantling racism. Now, are we there yet? Of course not. But has there been good learning along the way? Absolutely. Have some of us evolved and progressed in our understanding, have learned? Yes. Have we even had space and time for confession and repentance? Certainly we have, but there will always be more work to do. We don't get to sit back and check that box. Okay, done with that work. No, instead, we understand the work of anti-racism as a lifelong journey. One of the things that I love about your heart as a congregation is that it's like you made this detour and said, hey, here's a priority that we'd like to pick up and engage. Like my mother, who was always wanting to make an unplanned stop at a historical marker, you wanted to dig deeper and learn. This may not have been on our original trip itinerary, but we're going to add it now. You know, it's true that for most any of us, today. The future can seem ambiguous at best and even scary at worst. And it's true that we can look ahead uncertain about how we are supposed to be the church in the world today. But friends, there is so much that we do know, isn't there? We know that we are called to carry God's love into the world to all persons that we meet. We know that we are called to care and to share and to give ourselves our very lives for the sake of justice and peace. And aren't these the most important things to know? I pray and trust that as we cling to those priorities, all else will fall into place. The followers of Jesus understood that the journey is their home, the so-called destination always right in front of them as they seek to love and care and share, to do justice and live peacefully in the very places that life presents itself. This is the first lesson. It's not about the destination, it's about the journey. And the second lesson is related. The second lesson from the road trips of my childhood and those that I've experienced is that it really is all about the relationships. It's knowing that we do not go alone in this world. We don't go it alone. One of the family road trips from my own childhood that stands out to me is of the time that my parents took us to Disney World. My parents drove us three kids and friends, this of course was before the time of iPads or screens on the back of the seats so that we could kill time watching movies. This was, in the words of my own daughter, the ancient times, right? Well, a few years ago, a book came out called Don't Make Me Pull Over. What a title. And it's written about the great American road trip that was birthed in the 1970s. And it could have been written about my own family. A father who didn't really believe in bathroom breaks, siblings who entertained one another with ridiculous games that we created. I saw a quote the other day that said, it doesn't matter where you are going, it matters who is beside you. And I think of those earliest disciples who were headed out on their adventure. Jesus did not send them out alone. In fact, in other places in the scriptures, Jesus is quite intentional about reminding them that they will be sent out at least in twos on purpose. And I imagine those disciples visiting with one another along the way, talking about what they'd seen, processing what they'd learned, providing a listening ear to one another, a word of encouragement, perhaps even talking one another into taking on a challenge that they knew they needed to tackle. You see, friends, the life 
of sharing in God's love was never meant to be a solo act. Now, of course, of course, this does not mean that relationships are easy. One of the memories that sticks out to me from that family trip to Disney World is stopping along the way in Louisiana. And somehow as we left Louisiana and continued on our journey, somehow we ended up with a shoebox full of Mardi Gras beads. Well, the next thing I know, I can remember my sister using those Mardi Gras beads to divide the back seat. She was older than me, and so she informed me that she deserved more space. You know, I don't know how my parents did it. My siblings and I cooped up together for hours and hours in a station wagon, a station wagon that of course had that wood paneling on the sides. Our life in the church today means having a community of support and love. I don't remember a lot about my time at Disney, the so-called destination, but what has stayed with me, what has shaped and formed me powerfully is the time spent with family along the way. Family that I knew would care for me and look out for me and keep me safe. Memories still with me of how our relationships grew and deepened during that time. And in the best of situations, church is a family of choice where we do the same things. We care for one another, look out for one another, and we live together this thing called life. As it states in one of my favorite creeds, the Canadian Creed, God is with us and we are not alone. Thanks be to God. So the journey is our home, as important as the destination. It's all about the relationships. And our final lesson reminds me of the founder of Methodism, John Wesley, who said, the best of all is that God is with us. This is the last but most important takeaway from my road trip. Especially, especially as we look at the road ahead, as we look to the future, we trust that God is with us. Here's the thing. Here's a metaphor about driving. When we drive, we know that it's important to look every once in a while, every once in a while into the rear view mirror, to check it periodically, to look back. It keeps us safe. But mostly it's important to look ahead through the through the windshield. Even in the church, even in the church, it's good to look back and to reflect and learn from the past, to even grieve what once was. But the Church of Christ is not moving backwards in time, it's moving to the future. And God is calling us, needing us to look ahead with hope and trust. I, I think it's a fitting fact that the rear view mirror in our cars is smaller than the windshield in front of us. It's a good metaphor for how to live a life and how to be church. As I continued reading those New York Times pieces by Jessica Gross on religion in America today, I heard her capture what many leading religious scholars are telling us today. And that is that religion is not dying, it is changing. Friends, I'm excited here at University UMC where we will have a number of scholars sharing with us and visiting with us in the months ahead. Scholars who aren't afraid to name challenges, people of God who look to the future with authentic hope and courage. In August, our own John Elford will be with us to present from his book on racism in the United Methodist Church at a Lunch and Learn. And later that month, to the pulpit, we will welcome Reverend Dr. Amy Laura Hall, a professor of Christian ethics at Duke Divinity School. In September, we will welcome Diana Butler Bass, both for an evening lecture as well as our Sunday morning preacher. Diana Butler Bass often reminds her readers of this. She says, Christianity did not begin with confession. It began with an invitation into friendship, into creating a new community, forming relationships based on love and service. Friends all along this road trip called life, and all along this adventure called being the church in the world today, these words ground me and give me hope. 
because at our best, this is who the church has always been. It's the work that we are still called to be about today. Relationships based on love and service. We do not know exactly what the future holds, either personally or for our church and for our other communities. We have no crystal ball. And for sure, we watch the news and we have enough to worry about and enough to stress about. But in faith, friends, may we trust that God is with us. May we be assured that giving ourselves fully to the work of love and service is the very road into God's promise of hope and into God's preferred future for a beloved community. May it be so. I want to close this morning's sermon with a well-known prayer, a well-known prayer from the spiritual writer Thomas Merton. No doubt many of you worshiping with us today online likely know this prayer. His prayer speaks to our trust of God's presence in our life, even when we feel a great amount of uncertainty. And I'm going to share this prayer with you, and the words will be on the screen for you to either pray along silently or out loud. May we pray. My Lord God, I have no idea where I am going. I do not see the road ahead of me. I cannot know for certain where it will end, nor do I really know myself. And the fact that I think I am following your will does not mean that I am actually doing so. But I believe that the desire to please you does in fact please you. And I hope that I have that desire in all that I am doing. I hope that I will never do anything apart from that desire. And I know that if I do this, you will lead me by the right road, though I may know nothing about it. Therefore will I trust you always, though I may seem to be lost and in the shadow of death. I will not fear you, for you are ever with me, and you will never leave me to face my perils alone. Amen and amen.